of this seminar by various speakers. Matthew Russell will be the moderator. So, uh, good luck. So, uh, thank you all for coming. I think it's the, the first time in a while that we've done this, at least, I, I don't think we've done this since I've been here. Um, so I guess we have, and I know there's at least five people that we have lined up that we'll, we'll probably have about 10 minutes uh, for, for each of them, and then we have time remaining. We might have, be able to open up to if any members of the audience have anything else that they'd like to share. So, uh, anyways, I think we will start off with Neil. Oh, well, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to mention two open problems connected with Ulam, um, and then I have a project I need help with this summer. So to begin with, Ulam's famous sequence, A2858, which um, the first two terms are 1 and 2, and then the, for the next term, you look for the smallest term, which is bigger than um, the previous term, and is uniquely the sum of two different earlier terms. So we, be, we begin with 1 and 2, and um, 1 plus 2 is 3 uh, uh, in a unique way, and 3 is the smallest, and in fact the only choice, so we begin with 1, 2, 3. And now 4 we can get as 1 plus 3. We could get it as 2 plus 2, which would be a duplicate, but the terms have to be different. So 2 plus 2 doesn't count, so only 1 plus 3 counts. So unique, the, we can get 4. Um, 5, we could get in two ways, so the next term isn't 5, but 6 is unique as 2 plus 4, so, and so on. So that's the sequence, 1962. Ulam, so there are two or three open questions still about this. Ulam said that, it, that he thought it had density 0, that the frac if you look at the number of terms up to n, the fraction goes to 0. On the other hand, one of the regular correspondence contributors to the OEIS, Jeff McCraney, looked at about, um, I don't know, not quite sure, th three million terms. And he noticed that um, it was not going to zero, that the, the, the number of terms up to n seemed to be about 1 over 13.5 times n. So they can't both be right. Who was right? Well, if you look at a graph, if you look at the residuals between uh, a of n and 13.5 times n, then it wanders around. But after 3 million terms, it does not seem to be going to zero. So we need more data. Um, then, uh, last year, Stefan St Steineberger um, uh, noticed something very peculiar about this sequence. He wrote a paper, I don't know if it's been published, it's on his website, called A Hidden Signal in the Ulam Sequence. And he noticed that there's a funny number, about 2.57145, you could work it out to quite a few decimal places, which has the property that um, if you look at that constant times a n, then um, it is not uniform mod 2. Generally, you would expect if you pick a, uh, an irrational number and multiply it by um, the, the things should be uniformly distributed. This is very definitely not. And to make it precise, he said, let's look at the real part of the sum of the exponentials e to the x times a of n. Well, look, look at the sum of the cosines of x times a of n. As a function of x, where you take the sum over the first n terms. Now, if x is 0, you're going to get n. If x is not in 0, you expect everything to cancel, and it should be very tiny. And what happens, this is taking 100 terms, what happens is that there's a, sp a negative spike <coughs> at about 2.57 in the range 0 to 2 pi, and another one at 2 pi minus that number. So something very strange is going on. What is this? This seems to me something that would be well worth studying further. Another question, there's a sequence in the OEIS, which is the numbers that don't appear as the differences between terms of Ulam sequence. It looks like 6 is never a difference of two terms, 11, and so on. The, the entry has six terms. The trouble is, all of these are conjectures, even though we have Easy, it's easy to compute as many terms as you want. We don't know. Uh, is the six ever appear? Open question. It would be very nice to know more about this. 
Another Ulam sequence is his sequence of lucky numbers, which is sequence A959 from a paper he wrote with a bunch of people in 1956. And I tried to do it with Keynote, but it was such a mess. I just did it by hand. So, um, it's, so, so the lucky numbers, you start off, you write down all, all the integers, and then you look at the, um, the second, you, know, you put your finger on two, and you cross off every second term. Okay, and now you look at the, so now we've got one, three, five, seven, nine, we've got all the odd numbers. Now you look at the second term here, you say three. Okay, well now we're going to cross off every third number. So we go one, two, cross off, one, two, cross off, and so on. Now we look at what's left, we have one, three, seven, nine. We look at the third number in the sequence, and we cross off every seventh term, and so on. And the sequence you get is shown there. It goes one, three, seven, nine. 13, 15, etc. So the question that I have been thinking about, or managing not to think about for many years is, it's known that this sequence is very like the, 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 the sieve, the, what you get by the prime number sieve. This is a sieve, the Aristophanes sieve gives you the prime numbers. This gives you the lucky numbers. They're very similar, they're extremely similar. In fact, um, it's known that there's a, the number of, of lucky numbers up to n is essentially the same as the number of prime numbers up to n. They have the same distribution. So here's a picture. This is, this is um, the nth term in the primes. This is the nth term in the lucky numbers. And it's the same. And there's, there's a paper saying that with, uh, quite, for quite a, a wide class of sieves, you get um, a kind of a prime number theorem that applies to all of these sequences. Now, if you have an, a number and you want to know it, if it's prime or not, that's a famous, a famous problem that we now know a lot about. It, it grows in, it's a poly polynomial growth. The best results at present say that it's about log n to the sixth power to tell if a number is prime or well, what about lucky numbers? I, as far as I know, nothing is known about this. If I give you a big number, how, com how com complex is it to determine if it's uh, a lucky number or not? In fact, you could say this about many of the sequences in the OEIS. We tend to look at the uh, generating functions, occurrences, and so on, asymptotic behavior. But another question is the recognition question. If you pick a number, at random, does it belong to the Catalan numbers, and so on. Catalan, that's easy. You have to factor it. But, um, but uh, in particular for the lucky numbers, that seems like something that would be worth looking at. My uh, other thing... Is not even probabilistic algorithm, I guess. Not that I know of. Yeah. No. no, no, I'd be happy with probabilistic. I mean, because in this case, it's very clear. Um, so my other thing is, this summer I need some help. I have a project I want to do. Um, I could use two or three people to help this summer. If any of you are graduating, they're going to be around this summer, or even if you're not graduating, I don't care. Um, if you're going to be around this summer, I, I will pay. This won't be from the foundation. This will be out of my own pocket. It'll be interesting. This is not having to do with scanning old documents. <coughs> this is a, a real project that I need help with. If there are two, th two or three people preferably local, but if someone watching this is not too far away, that would work also. So uh, that's all I have to say. Let's, th let's thank Neil. And then Amina is going to be our next speaker. Don't know me. I'm a new faculty here. I am a uh, professor at uh, ECE, 
And for before that, this is my first semester, uh, before that for 21 years I was at Bell Labs Math Center and overlapped with Neil until mm -hmm. Bell Labs split, until AT&T Math Center split. So I stayed at Barry Hill, he went to Warren Park. All right, so this is an open problem in network multicast, which I kind of extracted uh, from the problem. And uh, so how do I change, just with a... The down arrow. Oh, okay. All right, so uh, here uh, I have this structure which is called a multicast graph. It consists of a graph. The graph is acyclic and directed. And uh, I have H sources. Um, source nodes, they don't have incoming edges. And then I have some other nodes. And those other nodes have in degree D, and D has to be between 2 and H. And then I have a set of labels. Um, in networks, we call them receivers, R1 to Rn. And then I have some label, uh, labeling groups, and these are the rules. So each label has to appear H times. Um, so it has to label exactly H nodes. Uh, nodes can have multiple labels. And uh, nodes that are labeled by Ri have to be reachable from the sources by node disjoint paths. So this is an example. Two nodes. Um, labels are R1 and R2. I have to use them two times. And R1 is here and here. R3 is here and here. And R2 is here and here. And I also need to uh, be able to reach every uh, receiver by two disjoint paths. So from S1 to R3 I would take this search and from S2 to R3 I would take this search and they're disjoint. So these are the conditions. Uh, so now the code design problem, uh, the multicast code design is the following problem. I need to select uh, vectors in uh, FQ to the H and assign these vectors to the nodes. And the sources get the standard basis. So S1 is going to be 1, 0, S2 is going to be 0, 1. And then each other node has to get a vector which is in the span of, its, of the vectors that are assigned to the parents. And we call uh, such an assignment a multicast code. So for example, a valid assignment here would be 1, 0, 0, 1, and then 1, 1, because it's in the span of 1, 0, and 0, 1, and, and then 1, alpha, or, or 0, 1 again. And it's interesting that here I can use 0, 1 again, and um, the reason is that when I previously used that vector, uh, I don't have a receiver that's shared between. So this property that I need to have whatever is labeled by the same receiver uh, linearly independent is satisfied. And it gives me a smaller field. And that's exactly uh, what the open problem is. Can such uh, selection of vectors be made and over how small field? So now, what do we know about that? So what do we know about that? So um, this is connected to network coding problem. The, this entire problem appeared about 15 years ago, but then sometime after that, we were able to show my co-author, Christina Fregulli, who is now at UCLA. Actually, she was visiting Dimex when we were working on that. Um, we know that for networks with two sources, um, field of size that is sort of order of the square root of two times the number of receivers is sufficient. And for networks with H sources, uh, the field of power size N is sufficient. For this, we know that there are networks for which this is necessary. For general H sources, um, we don't know any example where we need more than order of square root of N. And so the, here is what the experimental uh, math could possibly help, we actually, it would be nice to generate a counterexample possibly because what we believe is that something of this sort holds also for networks with H sources. Okay, so this doesn't tell you anything about how 
we designed that. So let me say just a word about that. So um, I always move the opposite direction. So with two, two sources, I can use the projective line vectors. So these are these vectors, 0, 1, 1, 0, and then I take 1 alpha. Uh, uh, in, the, in general, I can work in the projective space because only thing I care about is linear independence. So I can use these uh, points on the projective line and observe something uh, obvious that they are linearly independent, any two, and any two are, uh, uh, sorry, any vector in, in the span of any two. And therefore, I can completely dispose of the geometry of these and about linear independence I don't have to worry, and I can just treat them as labels, as colors. So I can design a code by uh, coloring and show the bound by a coloring argument. So what I skipped in this uh, little presentation is how we get from real networks to these graphs. So this was my multicast graph which I described because many real networks are equivalent from the coding point of view. So this is the, the graph, I, uh, that one with the sources, hyper receivers and things like that. From that, I can construct something I call a coloring graph, where I have just copied the nodes from here to here, and whenever two nodes share a receiver, I place an edge. Because I cannot use the same label from the projective line, I cannot use the same color here. Also, I cannot use uh, the same color for the two parents of a child, because if I did, I would have to, uh, I would not, span anything here, and in fact, even this edge would be extra, so the, uh, the configuration would not be minimal. So, based on this minimality property and this labeling, we are able to show so much structure of this graph that we can claim the size of the field for, for networks with two sources. We cannot, and this is my last slide, we cannot do that for uh, when, when uh, h is greater than 2. So, sort of, with that projective line, we disposed completely uh, of geometry and only dealt with combinatorics. And um, when um, H is greater than 2, we cannot do that. We can, if every node has H inputs, uh, then we can use an ARC or MDS code. Uh, but, roughly speaking, we have, to, we have this set of vectors with lots of structure. Uh, among them which we don't completely understand for, in a general case, and some have to be in the span of others, and some have to be linearly independent. So what we are trying to see, actually that was 2006, we stopped looking at that problem for a while, but then it started appearing again in other, uh, other groups we are trying to do for different reasons, essentially the same question. And then uh, why I decided to speak here is because last week at IPAM, I had, there was a small group of um, algebraic, there, there were some people doing algebraic geometry, some uh, number theory, there were six of us who were again trying to look into that problem. Um, so, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Let's thank Camille. Nothing here? Any other button? Oh. Okay, well, so while I wait for this thing to move very, very slowly up, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a problem in permutation patterns that will surprise no one. Uh, <laughs> so, Okay, so this is a little different from the classic permutation pattern problem where you're looking for permutations avoiding some short pattern. It goes, it goes like this. So, uh, what's a permutation? A permutation is a sequence of numbers like this. This is a permutation. This is a formal definition of a permutation. <laughs> um, and so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert one more element into the permutation. So, I will do this by picking a slot where I want to insert it, I, there are five slots, and I will also pick an element that I want to insert. So let's say I insert number three in here. So, okay, the result is not a permutation, it's one, three, three, four, two, so 
to deal with that problem, I'll say, when you insert an element, you have to bump up anything that's greater than or equal to that element. So inserting 3 here gives 1, 3, 4, 5, 2. OK, so this is how you insert an element into a permutation. What elements are you allowed to insert? You are allowed to insert any element between 1 and n plus 1, where n is the length of the permutation. So there are n plus 1 slots, and n plus 1 elements can be inserted. So naively, there are n plus 1 squared ways to do insertions. But some of them will result in the same permutation. For example, I could, I could insert a 3 here, but I get the same thing by inserting a 4 here. So OK, how many ways are there to insert an element into a given permutation? Well, if I am really just inserting one element, the answer is always n squared plus 1, where n is the length of the permutation. And that's known. This is a lot harder when you change the problem to, instead of inserting one element, insert two elements, one after the other. So for example, I could first insert 3 here to get 1, 3, 4, 5, 2. And then maybe I insert 2 here and get 1, uh, one 4, 5, 6, 2, 3. So that's an insertion of two elements. So given a permutation, how many ways are there to insert two elements? How many distinct permutations can you get by inserting two elements? And I've stated a problem for one and two, so you should also state the problem for many. Given r elements, how, if you insert r elements one after the other, how many different permutations can you get? So. Um, not a whole lot is, is known for r greater than 2. Even for r equals 2, the, the, there's a paper by uh, Ray and West that gives a formula, which is a, it's a fourth degree polynomial, and there's some constant term that depends on the permutation. Um, for three elements, there's going to be something more complicated. We don't know what it is. Um, and four elements and higher just seems totally intractable right now. So here's a suggested experimental approach to this problem. So one of the things that makes this hard to deal with is this whole bumping up thing. This is, this is just, it's just very complicated. So not only are you bumping things up, you're also inserting things in the middle and indexes change. And any kind of reasoning about it becomes very difficult. So my suggestion is that we could analyze this in the following way. Suppose you have two permutations. So, so you suppose you have two insertions uh, into a permutation. So you can insert at i the element j into the ith position and element k, uh, l into the kth position. Or you could insert. I prime, uh, uh, j prime into the i prime position, and uh, l prime into the k prime position. So we have four ordered pairs of numbers. And perhaps we can, there, there, are, there are many different cases for how these, the relative positioning of these numbers. So for example, i could be less than i prime, j could be greater than j prime, k could be less than k prime, and l could be less than l prime. Each of these seems to demand, from what I've done by hand, and what everyone finds when they first work on this problem, each of these seems to demand a completely separate analysis. And that's part of what makes it so hard. When there are three, when you're inserting three elements, even more combinations, right? So what would be really, really nice is to get a computer to analyze these automatically. Say, what has to be true about the underlying permutation? And just as an example of what I mean by this, I will do it for one insertion. So suppose here's a grid. This is the position, and I'm going to plot elements of the permutation on this axis. So here is i, j, and suppose that i prime, j prime is to the right of it and higher up. Now, you can pretty quickly say that 
in this region, you cannot have any elements. If, if, this, if these two insertions are to give the same permutation, there can be no elements in this region. Why? Because when you insert ij into the permutation, these are pushed to the right. But when you insert i prime, j prime, they are not. So if there's any element in this region, it's going to occur in a different position in the two permutations. So we can say that this place is empty. And similarly, by similar arguments, these places are empty. Also, with a little bit of the same logic, you can say that it doesn't matter what is going on in the permutation in these regions. So you could put any, anything you like here. The permutation could have elements in any arrangement here, and same with here, and here, and here. So anything, any, any, any. What's really the interesting one is the one in the middle, where the elements in the permutation basically, they, there's only one possibility for them. They have to be lined up diagonally like this. Possibly there could be 0 or 1, but they have to be lined up like this. So this is how the analysis works in the case when you're inserting one element. I've done a few cases of r equals 2 by hand. And so this proves n squared plus 1? You can use this to prove n squared plus 1. It's not as straightforward as we'd like, but, it's, but you can use this to prove the n squared plus 1 form. So I've done a few cases of r equals 2 by hand. And I wouldn't be surprised if you could prove Ray and West result that way as well. But in order to really make any progress on higher, uh, higher r, we need a systematic way to do this. So that's the problem. Let's thank Nathaniel. Can I ask something? Um, we well, you know a lot about what happens if you take a permutation of random, what a cycle structure looks like. What happens if you do this with one r equals one or two and look at the cycle structure of a random start with a random thing and do your operation? What's the resulting cycle structure? How is it, it must be biased in some way, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's, maybe it's random again. You know? I don't know. Experience tells me there's not likely to be a very strong connection between doing this and cycle structure, but there probably is something. I think, I think you have the right instinct, so that would probably be an interesting question, yeah. Okay, next up is Nathan Fox. All right, so I'm going to preface this by saying this is going to be a very short presentation. This is a problem that I, or a class of problem that I thought about maybe for two days, and I just thought I'd present it. Um, it'll be I mean, it'll basically just be, be me citing a bunch of void IS sequences and saying, look here. But the general theme is going to be writing numbers in various spaces and seeing what digits you get. No. So, what is 31 in various spaces? Well, 1011 one, one in base 3, and it's 133 uh, one, in base 4, and 111 one, one in base 5. I'm going to do this for a bit. 5-1 in base 6, 4-3 in base 7, 3-7 uh, in base 8, 3-4 in base 9, 3-1 in base 10, and then it's 2-9 in base 11. I'm going to stop there. You notice the first time a 2 appears is here. So the first question So, you know, so, so the first two, and you, when you do this, right, make the number of bases three on up. The first two for 31 appears in base 11. Are there any numbers where there's no twos in any of these bases? Have you checked? I have checked up to us. The, I have checked pretty far. Uh, the if such a number exists, it has at least 3,000 digits. Great. <laughs> but uh, um, <laughs> there's two, two OEIS sequences about this. There's sequence 216192, which is um, the first time you get to a certain base. And then there's 216194, which is which where the first two occurs as a function of 